Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this meeting. As we continue in what we began to study this last week, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance? For this subject has much for us to consider at this time. There is much that we need to look at, both within what we are seeing within the movement, but also what we are having revealed for ourselves. So shall we go before the throne of grace and ask for wisdom and understanding so that we may more clearly and directly apply these admonitions for us today. Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you in these Sabbath hours, we thank you for the rest and the removal of responsibilities. We know, Father, that it's on these Sabbath hours that you have even more requests made upon you. Help us now, Father, to understand this that was given, that is being shown for our admonition at this time. Direct us so that your will is done, so that our characters may become more like yours, so that as we come before others, your character may be fully represented, so that they may see your love, your compassion, your willingness and ability to save. I thank you for each one that is at this meeting today. I pray, Father, that we will be able to discuss these things directly and openly. Help us now. Guide us, we ask. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Now, paragraph that we read last week, Signs of the Times, 3rd of August, 1882, paragraph 13, is fairly direct for us. As we began addressing this, we are looking at Saul as a representative of the church, but also as a representative of the movement and a representative of ourselves at this time. Now, if there are those that disagree with this premise, please bring out your points. Let's address these things. Let's discuss them. That's the purpose of these studies. Saul's transgression proved him unworthy to be entrusted with sacred responsibilities. One who had himself so little reverence for God's requirements could not be a wise or safe leader for the nation. Had he patiently endured the divine test, the crown would have been confirmed to him and his house. In fact, Samuel had come to Gilgal for that very purpose. But Saul had been weighed in the balance and found wanting. He must be removed to make way for one who would sacredly regard the divine honor and authority. Now, is this an example of what we observed on July 18th. How would you take it? Well, observed in what way? With with the movement? Yes. Mm -hmm. As we pointed out and we were addressing last week, if we are observing one that is being weighed in the balance and found wanting, are we not also observing meany, meany, tekel, you farsen, mm -hmm. just as we had seen in the book of Daniel? The following paragraph states, an all-wise God had foreseen these events. So God knew what was going to happen with Saul. God also knew what was going to happen with the movement. Yet Saul's threatened humiliation was chargeable only to his own sin and his own folly. God had given him great advantages to develop a right character. The Holy Spirit had enlightened his understanding, giving him clear views of the divine character and requirements and of his own duty. All this made his sin more grievous. Now, in this, in this situation where Saul is concerned, did Saul have great light? Mm -hmm. Have we not observed that the church as a whole has had great light and has not the movement also been given great light. Yeah. So one of the things, you know, about this movement is we always felt that it was about uh, the church in the sense that, you know, we, that, you know, the seven bad Venice church is being passed by and all these different things. And the focus was always upon the sins of the church, not recognizing that the focus was really the light was given to us to, so that we could develop a right character. Right. Right. And, and, and we didn't realize that we didn't realize that our characters were the problem. We thought 
the people in the church that their characters were the problem. But it's, well, it's our characters that we have control over. One of the questions that has been asked multiple ways and multiple times, why has Christ not returned yet? Well, Christ's character hasn't been perfectly re- be, been reproduced in his people. Right. Until we are willing to allow his character to be reproduced in us, he cannot return. Mm-hmm. Now, I find it interesting from the chat, the comment was made, Gilgal, a wheel of whirlwind. So Samuel was coming to be able to confirm Saul's house if Saul was willing to be patient, if he was willing to endure the test. How many times are we placed into the fire of affliction and we wish to be removed from that fire immediately? Why was Saul being tested? Was it not to show the character that he would have represented it in the middle of a crisis? Gold tried to fire. Okay. Had Saul cherished the light which Christ had given him, he would have trusted less to the performance of religious rites and would have felt more deeply the importance of humbling his heart before God. Impulse would have been guided by reason and chastened and purified by conscience. But it is difficult for a man whose habits are fixed to unlearn what he has for years been learning. Divine grace only can affect this transformation. And we see here that Saul was being given light, but he set aside this light to hold on to his habits. How often are we guilty of this? The discarding of King Saul and the choosing of David in his stead made a condition of things wholly unpleasant for the one chosen in Saul's stead. David could not be anointed in Saul's stead without experiencing his jealousy. And what a time of it David had. Yet all this he was compelled to bear because of a disobedient king who refused to keep the way of the Lord and hearken to his voice. It was a very sad time for Saul, Samuel, and David, all because one man was venturing to follow his own hereditary and cultivated tendencies. The Lord had blessed Saul, chosen and converted him, and he was made head over Israel. He had God as his teacher through Samuel the prophet, but he would not hearken to the voice. He revealed himself to be an unsafe leader for Israel because he would not, because he would choose to follow his own way in the place of doing God's way and God's will. Saul had had all the promise that Cain had had. The words of God to Cain were applicable to him. God had declared, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Genesis 4, 7. Cain would not come to God's plans, and he killed his brother because he did not take his side of the controversy against God. Saul also justified his acts of disobedience when reproved through Samuel. What does this say to us today? We are on dangerous ground when we disobey. Agreed. When the message went out on July, for, regarding July 18th, was this message being given to warn the world? Yes, it was. Did this message do the job that God would intend for it to do in a manner such as the messages of William Miller? Well, we have to believe that it did, even though we don't see that many of the results yet. Have we seen many times within the Bible where a message was being given, but the results may not be immediately seen? Starting from the promised seed, yes, there are many promises we haven't seen fulfilled yet. We walk by faith and not by faith. Agreed. You got, the, you got the story of Jonah, too. Okay. We Nineveh, also- Nineveh didn't 
Nineveh didn't fall about 40 years after that, right? Right. But we also have Christ giving his warnings to the nation of Israel. His ministry began in 27. The ministry to the Jews was finished in 34. Yet 36 years later, it was when Jerusalem was finally destroyed. Now, these people, the nation of Israel at that time, did they not follow their own inclinations rather than follow the word of God? So we have many things that are here. To prove them, the Lord brought Israel into straight places. This is Youth's Instructor, 17 of November, 1898. The Philistines gathered themselves together to fight against the Israelites, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand on which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Here we said we found many symbols. Here we are. We had many that were willing to follow the movement on July 18th. And after July 18th, the movement has become very splintered. The people realized their sin in choosing a king, and they dared not put their confidence in him as they had trusted in the Lord as their ruler and authority. The new king was not God, and they were learning the meaning of defeat even before the battle had been entered upon. Here we are. Are we learning of God or are we learning of men? Are we putting our faith in what God has provided for our instruction and admonition? Or are we putting our faith in the word of men? We tend to want to follow people. Right. But why? It's easier. We would say it's easier uh, for a lot of people. And they want a king. They want a king, <clears throat> so to speak. You also want somebody to blame besides yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And if we go back, of course, in the Bible, do we not see that this has existed almost since creation? Mm -hmm. I mean, what was what was Adam's comment to Christ? The woman that thou hast given me did cause me to eat. Mm -hmm. I would say we haven't really learned our lessons very well. Samuel had given directions to Saul. Thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. And Saul tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. The Lord designed this as a test for Saul. As head of the nation, he must follow implicitly the counsels of God. Under all circumstances, he must obey the orders given him through one who received his instruction from heaven. But appearances were discouraging. And Saul looked at these appearances instead of looking to God, trusting in him, waiting for Samuel. He became impatient and took upon himself responsibilities which the Lord had not laid upon him. He attempted to do a work that he could not acceptably perform. Is July 18th just as much of a test for us as it was for the world? Mm -hmm. See, you know, this thing about appearances, we need, and this goes to the study from last night dealing with, with A.T. Jones. Right. Um, you know, being able to just trust that in spite of what, what we see happening around us, that God is in control and that we have the individual responsibility 
to do what God has asked us to do and to trust the things that we can't control to God. And, and that's what James and Ellen White did after the Great Disappointment. Um, they just trusted that God was leading them in spite of what they saw. I mean, you think about, you know, this huge movement and all you have is, you know, 50 people left, you know, that actually believe in it. And yet they were willing uh, and able to trust that God was going to take care of the situation. And and I think the big failure that that happens everywhere is that that we don't have faith. We're, we're just like the Israelites. And, and yet we can condemn them. We can condemn others and not recognize that we're just like those that we condemn. Any other comment? Okay. Comment from the chat. The Philistines had gathered themselves together to fight and pitched in Michmash to store away, which was eastward from Beth Avon. Beth Avon meaning the house of vanity. Is it not a vain thing for man to follow after man rather than following after God? The Philistines came in great numbers, just like at a point when you have groups that are receiving wonderful advanced degrees from man, and yet there are those in this little group that are not receiving these wonderful advanced degrees, but they are accepting and walking after the word of God. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. What's wrong with that? Why Why was it bad for Saul to offer a burnt offering? God didn't direct him to do it. He's a king. He's not a priest. He's a king. And what tribe was he from? Well, he's um, from Benjamin. the tribe. Of, he's a Benjamite. Yeah. <clears throat> and were the Benjamites to serve in the temple? No. Who was to serve in the temple? Levites. Why? Because they, they was appointed by God, by Moses, to be part of the house. The Levites were God's inheritance, correct? All right. That's right. Stayed faithful. They stayed faithful during, during, uh, below the mount. <clears throat> they stayed faithful when all of the other tribes were choosing to worship the golden calf, right? Yeah. So here is Saul choosing to force himself into the office of priest. Are we in any manner to force ourselves to do things that God has not presented before us. Are we to walk as Saul walked? No, we're not. Okay. But when the Lord exalted Saul to be king of Israel, he did not invest him with the sacred office of the priesthood. But as Saul as Saul saw the people terrified at the immense armies of the enemy, as he saw them fleeing to the caves and hiding among the thickets and the rocks, climbing to the tops of mountains and down into pits, he took upon himself this office. He trusted, Saul, in, burnt, he trusted in burnt offerings, not God. He also was responding to what he saw rather than what faith told him, right? Yeah. Are we to walk by sight? Nope. Are we to walk according to the word of man? Nope. This was Saul's time to act his faith, to show his respect for the special directions given. This is our time to act by faith. This is our time to give respect to what God has already shown. When Nashville is attacked, we know that there will be those that will stand and state that they knew that this was coming. They will have studied to understand. The problem is that there will be those that will be very upset because these others have understood and have studied and have not given them warning. We are to give a warning message beginning at the house of God. A few hours of waiting was the test that the Lord gave Saul. But Saul did not bow his knees 
and bow his heart before the Lord and trust in the God of Israel. He did not manifest the faith of Gideon and of the Hebrew generals whom God had appointed. In the place of becoming humble and self-distrustful, he grew passionate and presumptuous and knowingly transgressed in assuming the office of priest. He could have offered humble prayer to God without the sacrifice, for the Lord will accept even the silent petition of a burdened heart. But instead of this, he forced himself into the priesthood. Many times, brothers and sisters, we are having to learn the hard way that God will answer even silent prayers that are humbly offered. We need to accept that we are not in charge. The work that is going to go forward will go forward by God's hands because man has shown that he is incapable of doing the work that God has placed in his hands. As the king made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. And I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. What does this say to us about Saul's mindset and Saul's character? Well, he's definitely self-justifying in his actions. Right. And he has no real faith and trust in God. What does it tell us at this point right now? Well, it tells us we're pretty much the same. It's a hard thing to see this, isn't it? Yeah, but it's something we need to see. Our I mean, heart, it's, it's hard to see, yeah. It's easy to see it in other people. It shouldn't be so hard to see it in ourselves, hey? Right. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, and we see it with the fighting that has gone on in, in the movement, the way in which people have dealt with others. It, I mean, it's so painfully obvious that, that we don't have faith and trust in God. And, and this, of course, goes to the study from last night uh, on Jones. You know, to, to recognize that, that God is in control, even when it appears that he's not, um, takes faith. Yes, it does. But we have to believe that he's in control. And, that, and then when we see things going awry, we think that somehow we have to take control, that somehow... Because we see it, you know, we, we can somehow fix it. Abraham tried it. Didn't work. Right. He, he, right. he had to learn to trust in God. And, and that's the story of, of the scriptures. It's the story of mankind. But often we think that we are because we've been given light. We think somehow that we um, that we're responsible for it in, in a way that we're not. We are responsible for receiving light and obeying it but we're not responsible for the results, if that makes sense. Right. Now, it's kind of interesting for me this week. I had a sister that sent me something that I had not seen before. Try to, to bring this back up here. Now, this was shared with me Thursday, and it's something that I'm having to consider in all manner of conversation and in all times that I'm speaking about someone else. This comes from Manuscript 2, 1899, paragraph 10. So MS 2, 1899. When we are tempted to murmur or complain at something that someone has done, praise something in that person. Say, Satan, I have defeated your temptation this time. Cultivate the habit of thankfulness. Praise God over and 
over again for his wonderful love in giving Christ to die for us. It never pays to think of old grievances. God calls upon us to cultivate his mercy and his matchless love that we may be inspired with praise. Now, over these weeks, we have seen multiple times where there have been others that have been highly critical of many of the things that we have chosen to study and many of the things that we have looked at. There are those that would call us Judas. There are those that would call us unfaithful. There are those that would say that we are being untrue to this message. We need to find something in each of those parties for which we can be willing to lift them up and to say that this is something good about this person. I've ha- I'm having to deal with this on a daily basis with others that are questioning decisions that I'm making at this time. Now, here is Samuel and here is Saul. They are antithesis of each other. One brash, trusting in, in himself, the other humble, trusting in God, and they are face to face. Saul has now said, I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel declared, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hath not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. In detaining Samuel, it was the purpose of God that the heart of Samuel should be revealed, that others might know what he would do in an emergency. It was a trying position in which to be placed, but Samuel did not obey orders. Excuse me, but Saul oh. did not. Yeah. I think you said the heart of Samuel should be revealed as well, but you meant Saul. Correct, you're right. In detaining Samuel, it was the purpose that God would show the heart of Saul. And Saul had not obeyed orders. My mistake. Saul felt it would make no difference who approached God or in what way. Full of energy and self-complacency, he put himself forward into the sacred office. Brothers and sisters, the time in which we live is fearful. The time in which we live is terrible. The time in which we live is the time that all of the prophets desired to live because they knew that this time was going to be short and that many great things would occur. The Lord has his appointed agencies. And if these are not discerned and respected by those who are connected with his work, if men feel free to disregard God's requirements, they must not be kept in positions of trust. They would not listen to the counsel, nor to the commands of God through his appointed agencies. Like Saul, they would rush into a work that was never appointed them, and the mistakes they would make in following their human judgment would place the Israel of God where their leader could not reveal himself to them. Sacred things would become mingled with the common. Now, now this again relates to the study that we had last night, because Jones is addressing evangelical Christianity. Yes. And, and, and really what organization is, that God organizes the individual. Now, so often we can look at the church, let's say, and we can say, well, well, the church will say, well, we're God's appointed agencies, right? Right. And, and, even though things don't go the way that you think they they're going, you just need to trust that God is in charge. He's going to, he's going to take out the people of the, that are in the work that shouldn't be there and put right people in, in place. And there are some Seventh-day Adventists who kind of just trust that they say, well, 
you know, we see the church is in bad shape right now, uh, but we're, we're going to stay with the church because, you know, we know that the sinners in Zion will be sifted out in the end. And, you know, and, and it seems on the surface to kind of make sense, right? Especially in the context that we're talking about, about faith, right? Just trusting not by appearances. But yet we know that just because people claim to be of God's appointed agencies doesn't mean that they are, right? The church has entered into a new organization. We have books of a new order, the system of intellectual philosophy. Like um, I, I'm friends on Facebook with a guy named, uh, what's his name? He's he's an Adventist theologian. Uh, Re- Render Brunzema, I think he's Dutch. And, you know, and he has an article in Adventism Today called Why Historic Adventism Isn't the Answer. And, and you know, so he posts it on his Facebook page. And, and the people who follow him generally are what they call progressives, right? They don't believe in the 2300 days. Uh, you know, Ellen White, well, she was this nice, um, how does the guy put it? You know, a messenger of God, but yet he doesn't, he doesn't accept anything she says, right? Cause she's, she's not infallible. Well, what's the point of having a messenger if you can decide, um, to regard or disregard what they say? So, so the church has not fulfilled its role. It has been passed by. They were given lots of opportunity, but we know that they were passed by. They didn't receive the light that was um, to come at the last days. They didn't understand the time of the end. They didn't understand the significance of 1989, and they didn't understand the significance of 9-11. Now, when it comes to appointed agencies now, you know, how do we know what's an appointed agency? I mean, we've had this movement, you know, some people believe it was Parminder was the appointed agency that we have to listen to. Well, I think Jones lays down the principles in, in the study from yesterday of, of how the individual has to be connected to Christ. That there isn't something that we can look to. We need to be able to recognize those that are being led by God, not because they have some position of authority, but because they, they they follow God and speak with authority, not as the scribes. So we have to individually understand what is truth to know what direction we are to go. And we have to exercise faith. There is no shortcut. There is no person we can look to to trust in our salvation. The only one we can trust in is Christ himself. When we're looking at this phrase, appointed agencies, and then as she continued to state, and if these are not discerned and respected by those who are connected with his work, if men feel free to disregard God's requirements, they must not be kept in positions of trust. Now, was William Miller appointed by God? Mm -hmm. Yet how many times from... 1846 onward, have there been those that have set aside anything having to do with William Miller? I, I'm being called to task all the time because I refer to William Miller as Father Miller. I'm sorry, I interrupted someone. I think, I think, um, I think Miss White calls him Father Miller, don't he? Don't she? Yes, she does. But I'm, I'm called to task on that because as others have seen it, we are to call no one father except our Heavenly Father. I've used the term as Mrs. White has, because if it was not for the ministration of William Miller, we would not have had specific scriptures open in the way that they were. If it was not for Miller's rules, we would not understand the correct way to read and understand the interpretation of the Bible. We are not free to disregard God's requirements. And if we believe that we are, if we can think that we can set aside the words of the spirit of prophecy, Miller's rules, and many points of 
the prophetic understanding, then we should not be being kept in positions of trust. As she continued, they would not listen to counsel, nor the commands of God through his appointed agencies. We have seen many times where there are those that rush into a work that was never appointed them. Are we to change the words of scripture to fit individual ideas? Is this something, is this a work that we are to undergo? Well, you know, uh, just to share a little bit about, you know, my experience as a Seventh-day Adventist, there's been a lot of people through the years who who believe they have a special message for the church, right? I, I mean, I've seen tons of them. Sure. Uh, sometimes they're individuals. Nobody follows at all because they're a little kooky. Sometimes they're they're a bit more charismatic and they have some followers and they have some ministry. Uh, but they tend to go off into bizarre directions and, you know, the person becomes more important than the message. Right. And, you know, the thing I liked about this movement, because I'd seen so many different movements, um, was basically Jeff. I mean, I saw somebody who was not drawing attention to himself, wasn't interested in people really following him. He was interested in the message. Um, you know, he now some of the speakers in the movement I wasn't very impressed with. You know, those ones who left in 2014. Um, but, you know, there was something about this movement that was different. And, and it was also uh, demographically diverse, which which I thought was interesting because that was unusual. But, you know, when it comes to appointed agencies, those those things happen because of God. Right. I mean, God directs things. And, you know, and, and as a person, I've, I've discovered lots of things on my own and, and, and had beliefs, but never did I think that I would try to assert myself to be, you know, have people follow me or anything like that. Because I always have believed that if what I'm believing is the truth, if God is showing me the truth, that he's going to have, one, other people presenting those truths, right? And 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 if he wants me to be like what I'm doing now, sort of leading out in, in what's happened with this movement, that that would happen under God's providence is not because I pushed it. Right. Um, so I, I didn't put myself in this position and 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 it's and it's it's not a huge position or anything. It's just, you know, we're just a small group of people. But, you know, sometimes people want to be God's appointed agencies. And they don't realize that that's, one is it's a huge responsibility. And and the only people that God really will choose are the ones who wouldn't have chosen themselves, right? I mean, who chose Saul? Right. What, what, the question is, who chose Saul? So anybody can answer that question. You're holding so. God chose Saul. God didn't choose Saul. God sent Samuel over there. Over. Okay, but but if you know the story, why why did why did the the people were involved in 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 Saul, right? Saul was taller than everyone else. Well, I mean, you could say God God had a part in it. I'm not saying that he didn't, but didn't he leave first? Were they to have a king? Yeah, they wanted a king, so. Yeah. Okay, so they wanted a king. And so God, God gave them the type of king they wanted, right? Because yeah. when it was but was they but was they supposed to have a king? No, no. Oh. No, they were not. They were not supposed to have a king that was supposed to follow Jesus Christ. And they chose the king instead of Christ. Yeah, and, and they chose by appearances, right? So Saul appeared to be you know, the king that God would want. It's the king the people wanted. But Saul was lifted up in pride. Even though he appeared to be humble at first, he was lifted up in pride. Very quickly, he... Thanks he to the people. Because of the people, right? Now, yeah. David, on the other hand, he was a God after a man after God's own heart. And him, he was not the likely choice, Right? 
Correct. Okay. And and it even took time for him to unite Israel, right? It's not like he was made king over all of Israel at first. It took time for him to unite Israel. So, you know, sometimes we can, um, I guess, you know, the point is we need to trust that God knows what he's doing. And we need not, um, we need to recognize that his appointed agencies are going to manifest a certain type of character, which is a dependence upon God. Saul didn't have that. David did. Now, David had his faults as well. So, um, but he was still a God, af- a man after God's own heart. God had chosen him. He didn't really choose Saul. The difference, the difference between Saul and David was David. He repented, really repented for what he mm-hmm. did. But Saul never did. Yeah, he always thought he was right. So that's mm-hmm. the difference. Yeah. Now, so I mean. You know, we, we can say God chose Saul if we wanted to, but really God, and, and this is, I mean, this is not really related to Miller at all, but it's just that just because somebody has been a leader, it doesn't mean that they always are to be a leader, whether they're chosen by God or not. And are rallying everybody around them, I guess. They, they need to be faithful to God, right? And, and really it comes down to individual responsibility. That individually we need to be connected to Christ. But when you want a king, you're going to get a king. And you're not going to be happy about it. I mean, plus we led astray, of course. Mm-hmm. Okay. For this next week, we're going to be returning to both paragraphs 10 and 11. We are now coming close to the close of our time today. Are there any other comments or any other questions? I thank you each for your participation. So shall we now close in prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, help us so that we may depend more upon you and not upon ourselves in all that is to be done in these coming days. We ask now for your blessing. We ask for your guidance. Direct us and show us that that you would have us to do. Be with us now. In all things, show us, Father, that which we should do to glorify you. We ask, Father, for a blessing upon the message that we are about to receive. Direct us now. Show us, Father, how we may more properly glorify you. For this we ask, for this we pray, and for this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.